warm Midwestern myth so much. So um, thank you. Uh, today, I want to talk to you um, about basically my passion, which is bio-inspired locomotion. Uh, this is a video of a bird. I could take this out and put a monkey, an elephant, a squirrel. Um, and this should just create happiness in your, in my mind, at least of how just gracious and agile these organisms. Before I dig in, I have to say that this work is possible because of an incredible group of graduate students and undergraduate students. Um, the work highlighted here is sponsored by the following agencies. And what I really would like you to see throughout this uh, presentation is um, there's a lot of the projects are gonna include knowledge about a biological system, uh, accurate representation of the biology, combined with engineering analysis and experiments, and the x-axis, you're looking at shared structure with nature. If you're non, if you're non-biomimetic, then you neither. Like you don't have nothing to do with nature, basically. Uh, if you just look like nature, like think of the Sydney Opera House, if you think about, uh, you know, lotus flower buildings, this just it looks like nature, but it's not really uh, doesn't serve any function uh, that related to the natural systems, at least. Uh, if it works like nature, but that doesn't necessarily look like nature, this is what I call bio-inspired. So this is where you're really understanding the physics that govern the biological organism that allows it to uh, achieve a certain function. And then you capture that physics to get a similar function in the engineering system. And of course here, uh, if it has, is nature, right? So here the thing with synthetic biology, there's actually this new field, uh, it's not new, but like newer field of like hybrid robot, uh, um, bio-robotics and bio-hybrid robotics, which includes parts of nature. Um, my work is on this side of the uh, spectrum, and it relies heavily in creating analogies, looking at the system, understanding the physics, and creating an, analog an analogical design. Now, from the video I showed you earlier from this, it's obvious that we as engineers have a lot to learn from biology to design better air airplanes, better jumping robots, better networks. Uh, however, this is only half of the story, and I want to really highlight that, that the other half is we as engineers can actually give back a lot to biology in terms of creating controlled experiments to answer key biological questions that are almost impossible to do on the live organism. And for most projects, you might end up saying, I just want to know what this bird is doing so I can make better UAVs, uh, but you actually end up doing both. You end up saying, oh, I wonder what this is. And how, what, and this creates hypothesis and an iterative process. I call this the two-way street between biology and engineering. And you can walk this street in many fields, materials, uh, collective behavior, um, uh, lots of lots of controls, lots of really um, you know, um, areas. My lab really focuses on bioinspired movement and locomotion. So today I want to uh, share with you uh, some of the work we do. Uh, in this street called by inspired movement and locomotion more um, and I want to show you what we can learn from biology and what we can teach biology or can help answer biology questions in terms of actuation and locomotion strategies on one side and on the other side in terms of control strategies passive and active uh, the little caveat is I do not close the loop uh, very often and what I mean here by control is going to mean slow control or flight control but we'll, we'll talk more about that. So let's get going. Uh, I wanna first start with actuation strategies. Uh, we study click beetles. This is work by my former uh, student who's gonna be now a professor at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, Dr. Ophelia Bowman, and my current PhD student, uh, Tegan Mother. Meet click beetles. Have you played with click beetles? Who have played with click beetles? Thank you. They're awesome. There's a bunch, like get out and play with them. They're awesome and they're not harmful. Uh, I don't know if the audio is going to work or not. Let's hope so. This is actually what a click is. Uh, and, if, and actually, if you look at this, Gito is escaping out of this person's fingers and it's going to fall, I think. Here we go. Yeah. Uh, so this is what, what a click beetle looks like. If you hold something and start clicking, it's a click beetle. Um, and if it's unconstrained, uh, it this clicking maneuver to actually launch itself uh, off the ground without using any legs. All right, think of it as a really fast setup. We can all practice from four to five. 
All right. Um, <clears throat> now, what's really interesting about foot beetles is they belong to these uh, group of organisms in nature that exhibit ultra fast movement. So if I ask you what is the fastest organism, what's the highest acceleration, a lot of you will have cheetah uh, ideas. Uh, yeah, no. If you actually look uh, at the accelerations of cheetahs, they're looking at like maybe 15 meters per second square. Things like trap jaw ants and mantis shrimp, you're looking at millions of meters per second square. Uh, what's so this is mantis shrimp use this to uh, as a, in a striking maneuver. Um, trap jaw ants use their close their mandibles really fast. That's the ultra fast movement. We use this for jumping or for escape. To, for escape. Uh, slug beetles can use this to again jump without legs and we talk about 20 times body length for some species. Um, why the foot beetles do this? It's not for jumping. I mean, we can talk more about. I, I I think it's not for jumping, but as an engineer, I'm interested in how how can we jump like that anyway. So, uh, the actuation strategy, um, that allows these ultra fast and ultra fast animals to do these ultra fast movement or high acceleration, is called uh, flash mediated spring actuated. Uh, which people here are very familiar with this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and what ha what happens is it's like this bow and arrow analogy that you know has been introduced by uh, Sheila Patek a few, uh, maybe actually not several years ago. But rather than directly throwing an arrow, right? Rather than directly moving the appendage, these organisms use uh, a muscle to load a spring. The muscle remains intact to prevent the spring from recoiling. And then there's a release. And then that fast release can throw the arrow at a much higher acceleration than you just throwing it by hand. Can you picture that, right? Take an arrow, throw it by hand, use a bone arrow. This is exactly the actuation strategy that as engineers, we can learn from. Uh, click beetles, we know that they use this strategy, but actually before we started working, there was a lot of question about what are the latch spring and energy release and recoil mechanism in click beetle? Those were unknown. And uh, we can say, we can, make hypothesis and test things, but I would also like to test some of these with a physical system. So I'm gonna to talk to you about those two things today. So let's first, uh, you know, look at uh, trying to get what is the latch spring and energy release mechanisms for beetles. To do this, uh, we, we know from research that if you, a clit beetle body, oh, here we go. It's made out of, like, there's a head and there's a body and there's a hinge in the middle. And previous research shows that if you damage the hinge, it can't click. So that's a good place to start looking of, you know, what are the mechanisms that enable clicking? So if you look at this, uh, here's the motion and here's what clicking looks like. I'll play, play again from the outside of the organism. <clears throat> and if you look closely to this thoracic hinge, you'll see there's a peg and a lip right there. The hinge is made out of a peg and a lip. And then um, if you, for the rest of the presentation, I'm gonna show you these extra videos. It took me a few months for, to understand what my students understood in a week. So I'm gonna show you this picture before I show you any of the other stuff. So to look, you know, it's really hard to see anything on the inside, right? To distinguish what, where's the lashing, where's the spring. So to do this, we do a high-speed x-ray. So we go to uh, the advanced photon source in Chicago, and we take high-speed uh, x-ray at about 30,000 frames per second be able to resolve some of the temporal scales that you know that are involved in this. So first let's look at latching. What you'll see here is during latching, the peg slides up and sits on the lip. So and if you look at the structure, the peg and the lip are actually conformal surfaces. Uh, you can look at this picture and imagine how that see that this lip right here sit on this uh, little you know notch here. And a schematic of what you're seeing in this video is basically well, that's what's happening. The peg goes up and then it latches. And uh, so this is a type of latching that's a, uh, a, a mechanical latch. Basically two surfaces coming in contact and there's forces that are holding like the geometry of these surfaces and the forces holding them in place. Okay, so that's latching. Let's look at loading. This is now we're going to pull on some kind of bow like structure. And here's here's the loading. You can see it again now. 
So here you go, you'll see it. Here's latching and then load, load. All right, so this is the soft cuticle or spring like that's being loaded. Uh, the loading happens 146 milliseconds. The recoil, which I'm gonna show you later, happens in 0.8 milliseconds. Uh, if we hope that energy is then if you take energy divided by time, this will give you the power, right? And then this is the idea that sometimes this motion is re referred to as power amplification in the sense that the energy release time scales happen a lot shorter, happens at a lot shorter time scales compared to the loading, right? So um, then if you go look at the kinematics of the release, maybe, you'll see that there's addition. So the latch gets undone, right? This is your hand letting go. And then you'll see oscillations back and forth. And if you look at it, here's the position, X, Y, and position of the tip of the peg, this red point, and its acceleration. And if you want impressive numbers, uh, the velocity here is 1.7 meters per second. This peg is uh, about one or two millimeters. So you're looking at a thousand millimeters per second. Mm -hmm. uh, and the acceleration is about 330. Right, so these are the type of accelerations. So this creates a lot of really interesting questions, right? If you're a materials person, you might be saying, how come there's no damage? Or what are the some of the, how does the structure store and release this energy? Uh, if you're an, an person is interested in designing robots, well, how do I make a robot that, you know, can capture and produce these accelerations to allow me to, for example, decouple my crawling mechanism from my jumping mechanism so I can have fail systems. Regardless your angle, uh, kinematics are usually not enough and you want to really jump into the dynamics. So <clears throat> we did what we call nonlinear system identification. So we started by uh, making some model assumption of what, what are the dynamics governing this release. So one degree of freedom system, we know from spectral analysis and I can get into that, that it is nonlinear system, it's a nonlinear system. And from looking at the oscillation I showed you, it is a damp system. So uh, this is a very general model structure. We do nonlinear system ID, uh, and basically uh, our system identification models to generate what does G look like and what does F look like? What does the elastic forcing function look like? What does the damping forcing function look like? And when we do this, we find the following. We find that the damping uh, function, the damping force function looks like a quadratic. As somebody who comes from an aerospace background, like, I know it, it's drag. It's not. Uh, the coefficient of drag that you're seeing is very high compared to what you would expect at this scale with the weather surface area. So what it's actually more likely to be, this is the viscoelastic damping from the muscle. So if you model a muscle, you would model it as a spring mass and a damper. So this is what you're looking at, um, muscle damping, because as the, as the bow is released, right, uh, unlike in an arrow where the arrow just leaves, right? The muscle is still attached to your project, your, your projectile. But we have to, we want to validate this and uh, we hope to do this soon. If you look at the forcing function, this should be something that you're familiar with or you've seen before and it should create a really interesting thing. I showed you the picture, right? Uh, of what it looks like during the release. Um, the elastic forcing function, and some of you do this, looks like snap through buckling. There's two energy states that are stable, that are separated by unstable equilibrium. So you can uh, snap, go from one state to the other. Now, I don't know what's really snapping inside this beetle. Uh, we don't know if it's the cuticle, like the exoskeleton of the beetle. Uh, actually, I, right now, it's a really good hypothesis. There's a part in the hinge that I did not show you called the mesonotum, and it looks like a saddle. Uh, which is actually a very common structure in landfill systems or latch media spring actuator system. And we think that's what's snapping and we're doing some analysis now on it going from one state to the other during recoil. Um, this was informed by a really awesome study on the CT scans of a quick beetle that came out um, the last year or so that really is an excellent study. Uh, so now we know that quadratic damping and uh, snap through buckling for the sake of, uh, the next step is to see, okay, now, how do I really think about how this energy is transmitted from one part of the beetle to the other? And I can talk to you about something. We're building a mobility power flow uh, flame framework that I'm happy to talk to you about if you're interested. Uh, for the sake of time, I want to just kind of expose you to a lot of things. So um, we're, but that's how we're using these forces now. We're taking this to think about if you initiate the movement at, let's say, the head of the beetle, how does energy propagate through the body and 
uh, how is it a function of the frequencies that are present in this uh, release or not? But the question I want to answer with you now is, okay, we have all these hypotheses about it. We think that's what's snapping. We think that's what's causing the damping. We have all these questions. So we want to validate it. And I want to validate it using something called an RMO. This is a robotic model organism. And I want to set the expectation, because you're going to hear this word a few times in my, in my slides. RMO is not meant to be a jumper. So we're building a system, not just a jump, because we, and we have done this in a collaboration with other labs, create a jumpering inspired by snap to buckling. And that's very um, important work. The, the reason why you would build a robotic model organism is to be able to validate some of the conceptual understanding of what is happening is to be able to explore parameters that you can't explore. It's really hard to take a beetle apart and put it back together. I've tried, but we can do that with a robot, right? So that's the point of this RMO. Uh, so we started very simple, like really simple, all right? This is, your, your eyes are not deceiving you. This is a paper <laughs> okay? But spring steel with, with two 3D printed parts. And uh, we created a launcher and we're able to really characterize that. So we're using this to see, does the mass ratio matter? Does the length ratio matter? Are beetles uh, trying to, like are most beetles look the way they are uh, in terms of mass ratio and length ratio? Does that help with their jumping performance? Is that not? Is it another, for another reason? Uh, we're able to look at the effect of the curvature, whether this is really a rolling maneuver or, <coughs> excuse me, it's bouncing off of the ground. So these are all the things that we can study with this very simple thing. However, uh, this requires external loading and external latching, right? This is here, there's a graduate student hand that you don't see. Here, there's like electromagnets and servos. <laughs> excuse me. So the next step now is to look at the latch. So to do that, we do CT scans of different species, of different scales. And to try to try to understand the effect of the geometry of the latch, we you know started by 3D things that are the needles like 25 times the real size. We start with that, uh, but we're able to get it down to 10 times the small species. But it's actually um, now we're actually at the length scale of the beetle. So we've designed this, and now here this is a 3D printed thing with a really high uh, with the latch with the peg and the lip. And here we're able to test does the shape of the peg matter. Uh, does the uh, there's a friction plate on these pegs? Does the depth of this friction plate matter? Can you modulate the latching and unlatching force by just changing the line of action of a muscle? All these very simplistic questions that does both allow us to design better robots, but actually understand the beetle uh, mechanics better. And now we started combining both. So you'll you'll see here there's a spring, there's a latch. I, it's hard to see here, but there's artificial coiled muscle that we're using to do the loading. Uh, we just started on this. So here's my graduate student showing that this does latch uh, and unlatch. So we're just starting. But with this beetle, as far as the RMO is concerned. So this shows that when you work on a project that involves biology and engineering with open questions in both, you often end up uh, making contribution to both fields, which is a really interesting place to be. And you start exploring all different kinds of tools uh, that help with both. All right, so beetles aside, now let's look at locomotion strategy. So I talked to you now about an actuation strategy, which is using springs and elasticity to move things really fast. Now let's talk about locomotion strategy. And our star feature is the flying fish. So uh, who knows about flying fish? All right, so I did it. My student walked in my office and said, look at this. And I'm like, this is fake. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a fish that takes off uh, from the water surface. It's a school of fish. And when there's a threat, they kind of leave the water and they get out uh, in numbers to escape a tuna. But if this fish jumps too high and glides too high, there's a seagull waiting. <laughs> and if you have time, it's Friday. You should have time. Go to BBC and write The Hunt. It's a four minute video that's narrated by Devin Edinburgh. And it's just awesome. We don't have time for it now. I mean, we can do it later, but uh, it's so, but now let's think about really the locomotion of the flying fish from a like systematic way. So it's a fish. So it swims. It's a school of fish that swims in big groups. 
Uh, now, when a threat is introduced from the bottom, so let's say uh, a tuna is ready to eat, then the flying fish leaps and deploys their pectoral fins, and they have very large pectoral fins compared to uh, fish, right? And they deploy them and these act like wings. Sometimes the flying fish doesn't have enough um, forward velocity to be able to glide. So what they do is they taxi on the water surface. So what this looks like is their caudal fin or their tail, their caudal fin or their tail is flapping. And there's this really interesting wake that you see in the water surface until enough uh, speed is generated, forward speed is generated, and then it glides like a glider. Now, what's really awesome about the flying fish is if the threat does not go away, they don't have to go back in the water and jump back. They just keep doing this. They do this for a half a kilometer. Half a kilometer. All right. Think of the energetic, right? And then when the threat is away, maybe hundreds of meters later, it goes inside the water and, you know, it goes around, you know, around life being a fish again. So now if you look at some of the anatomical features of this is really enlarged pectoral fins and an asymmetric caudal fin. And uh, there's maybe three or four papers on flying fish from a biology standpoint, and most of them are like in the, I want to say 70s, like two in the 70s and two in the 90s. Um, so there's lots of open questions as far as uh, you know, biology is concerned, but lots of really, I want to make a robot that can do this, right? Can you imagine a robot that is able to swim, take off, and then land meters later? The applications are back, right? If you want to do mapping, if you want to do lots of other things. They do this for the smart fishing part of the water travel. This is a really interesting question, and we're start, we're actually doing this now. Uh, there's two. You can think that there's, you know, because of the difference in density, it's probably a lot easier for them to escape if half of their body is out of the water or most of their body out of the water. Uh, or it could be that most of the threat is coming from the bottom, so they just need to leave the water. And we're actually investigating this with some experiments and I'll show. But yes, very good. Actually, listen, ask questions, please, in the middle of the, yes. So this is, I, I don't know. We should ask the fish bio. Like, I'll ask my collaborator who's a fish bio mechanician, but they're able to taxi, they take off, they taxi, they take off. I think they're very fast. So, I should say this. We, I actually observed them in Barbados. We went to Barbados to do some uh, field work and we got video footage of them. They haven't processed yet. There's six hours of video, but they're very fast. Like, it's really hard to see them. I'll show you a video. So, this takes, we're looking at seconds, like, not, you know, not as you, uh, like, I think they do. I don't want to say whether the, the takeoff is 10 meters per second, but what they're flying, what they're swimming at, well, what they're gliding at, we don't. So, a question about even <laughs> five takes or the mm -hmm. amount of do, do you have any like uh, experiments or, uh, you know, your perspective about the dynamics of this five picture? It looks like switching, the more like switch the control, switch the system is uh, the fly fish without using wings mm -hmm. and then fly fish using wings. Fish using wind and also the text. So, is, is there any three models you can start and uh, from which system mm -hmm. perspective and then for different task and the object function? It's yes. very interesting to you know to so, use maybe an optimal control switch system model the whole process. The, so, we know very little. We know things like, for example, that here they're flapping at 50 hertz. Mm -hmm. However, this number is not. I, I've talked to lots of fish by mechanicians and they don't think this is possible uh, just because of the musculature. Mm -hmm. However, there's something called needle fish or guard fish. Maybe I'll show it afterwards. Mm -hmm. They do exactly this, but they don't have the pectoral fins. So they just taxi, but then they don't take off. They have to go in the auto auto and taxi again. <laughs> so uh, this would be an comparative study, right? Where you have something that doesn't have the pectoral fin that's taxiing versus something that's just gliding, right? So, and there are, um, I'm gonna eat a squid that are able. I don't know. Anyways, so squid and they're able to just jump, right? They jump out of the water and they flop. So, uh, yes. So this would be really interesting. Like they were separate dynamics, and they're all like there's a transition and switching, and uh, however, it's the same body, same yeah, dynamics, right? Yeah, different parts. They yes. Use a part and the a plus b and a plus b plus c. Yes. Thing. Exactly. Yeah. And, yeah. and this is no, but this is really, so I, 
I will actually do a little bit of that here, but we should talk more. So uh, again, as you can imagine, it's really hard for this to just, you know, put a flying fish in the lab, even if you're a fish biologist. Uh, so we designed a very simple robotic model and it allows us to do this, to take out the caudal fin and put it back on, to put on pectoral fins and take them out, to change the flapping frequency and amplitudes. And <clears throat> here's the robot in on a pin, right? And here's a cat of it with a pectoral fin. And you're able, we're able to, uh, you know, change. This is a very modular design. design. And um, and the first, this is the ATSB. If you look at, there's maybe 27 species of flying fish. And some of them are four-winged species. So they have enlarged pectoral fins and enlarged pelvic fins. And some of them have just enlarged pectoral fins. So we wanted to ask, what is the role of the pelvic fin during gliding? And how come some can do it, some can glide without it, and some can glide with it? So what is that feature and what does it do for the aerodynamics? To do this, we did wind tunnel experiments of our RMO in the gliding phase, and it's highly modular. So I can take this pelvic fin and I can move it down the fish body, right? I can also change the relative incidence angle between the pelvic fin and the pectoral fin. And what we found is that if you have a pelvic fin, it creates a really interesting trade-off between efficiency and stability. So we found that as long as you're in your, you're the back half of the fish, you're almost you're equally efficient. But the um, if you change the angle to make it more and more negative, you become more stable. So there is a trade-off because we actually went to the uh, to the crowd. We did some crowdsourcing and we said, please send us pictures of flying fish. And people sent us lots of pictures, really good pictures like this one, for example. And when we took the flying fish body and we divide it into, <clears throat> uh, you know, this is a, take the, the pelvic uh, fin scale and we kind of put, you know, discretize it. We found that the pelvic fin for most of the four wing species happened at this location where it's asked enough to be equally efficient, but in a place that is in the back to be stable. Uh, not the most stable location, the most stable location will be all the way in the back, but it's actually doing this trade off between stability and efficiency and agility, right? So these kind of experiments we can do to look at the role of the pelvic pin, for example. <clears throat> and we can do, of course, we can do things like remove any and add these components in this modular arm. We also asked another question, like, this is really, you know, not a lot of fish have this, what we call it heterocircle caudal fin, where one part is enlarged, the part in the bottom is enlarged, and the part, you know, top. From the few studies that I told you to 1941, looking at the flying fish, the hypothesis in biology is during taxiing only, only the bottom half of the flying fish, the half, bottom half of the caudal fin is in the water. However, during taxiing, if you really think about it, this is the most energetically intensive flapping because they need to accelerate really fast, right? Whether, you know, yes, it might be efficient because drag is reduced, but they have to flap really fast compared to swimming. It's an escape maneuver. So we wanted to study that. Is it really, the, does the submerging only the bottom half of the caudal fin maximize thrust? So we did that. Here's in the water channel, here's the robot <clears throat> with the caudal fin, we did symmetric and asymmetric, homocircle and heterocircle caudal fins. We varied the depth of this, we changed the angle of attack. Uh, we're trying, this is, this is very recent results. Uh, we're hoping to expand this a little bit more, but we find actually there is no evidence, right? So if you think about uh, this uh, middle, right? Depth compared to fully submerged, which is this blue, there is no evidence that if you only submerge half of your caudal fin, you maximize thrust. And actually that makes sense, right? I mean, we're doing this experiment you would think the more submerged you are, the more reaction force you produce. So maybe it's not about maximizing thrust. Maybe there's a different objective function, right? So uh, maybe it's the, so we have, we're doing some really interesting, we're now looking actually at the kinematics and we're doing some PIV to look at what the, you know, what's happening and why. It also could be that this is 1941 and cameras were not that fast, right? And for you to tell me that this thing is going that fast and really precisely at half depth 
I'm skeptical. It might not be, it might not matter, right? It might just, it might be that it's enlarged to give it the best chances of touching the water surface. Any chance it could be to reduce hydrogen in the dragon? For the submerged, like the, so you have the, the, you can generate a lot enough thrust, but not kind of really just dragon. You mm have -hmm. just the water. So this actually, this is the net force in the propulsive direction is actually thrust minus drag. So, um, so also I think just because of think of the wetted surface area, the difference is not that much uh, if it can buy you that much, uh, you know, drag improvement. However, that that what we will we're actually doing that. We're doing some. We're looking at doing some very simple analysis of looking at the thrust, the thrust vector, doing some estimates of drag. Uh, we're actually designing an experiment where we're going to do this and we're going to actually induce some forward velocity to estimate because this is happening when there's no incoming velocity when it's sliding. So that might make a difference. So, when you make these hypotheses, uh, with this many things that there's a bunch of studies that we've been and it's a what you did in these important techniques. Must be something that is a good But uh, if you think about it in terms of evolution, the fish might have evolved to be this way because it's can I tell you something? Yeah. This question makes my heart happy. <laughs> <laughs> Your question makes my heart happy. Because that's exactly right, right? A lot of those things that we as engineers want to rely to like a functional benefit might not be, right? So uh, a lot, so there is a study that looked at the genetic, like comparing flying fish to close ancestors and found that the things that happened through evolutionary, you know, iteration were enlarged pectoral fins and these things became asymmetric. So uh, what kind of evolutionary pressures drove this? We don't know, but we're hoping that the test, we're, so we're looking at just, you know, thrust is one of the metrics you can look at, but we're looking at the kinematics. We're looking at, actually, we're doing some CT scans to, um, it might be a function of the material we pick, right? So we're doing some CT scans to try to make things as bi-relevant as possible. And if we find there is no a functional benefit, I don't think that's a waste of our time. This might support that there's other pressures that have to do with survival or, um, however, this happens in both male and female flying fish, so it's not a reproductive. There are other fish where the male have a really long caudal fin and the females don't. don't. And that's like a select, like, you know, mating, attra mate attraction stuff. Here, both males and females have them. Um, so we'll see. So I think, uh, I mean, I think as far as I understand, that's how they understand what caused the three things. So are you doing something like this? So we're we're the I'm gonna look at what you mean with this adaptive landscape, and I'll talk to my collaborator who's a who is who's an evolutionary biologist and fish mechanician. What we're trying to see from now, we have two we have two pressures in this, uh, you know, collaboration, right? Part of saying what aspects are really important to carry over for a robot, and in this from that point, maybe I'm I'm not I want to know what's happening. Maybe it's a trade off or. From other aspects, what you're saying is really important. So what to do this, what we're doing is we're actually taking this fish and the needle fish and other you know, close relatives, and we're trying to do some comparative studies. And that will help, you know, um, you know, elucidate because this is one of the, I think the only fish that I know of besides the needle fish that does the exact same thing. So many questions, but I'll, I'll just keep asking yeah. questions. So this is at scale of, of this the, is at scale of the larger species. Yeah, so there are much smaller structures. If we normalize that with the weight of the mm -hmm. of the transition, mm -hmm. does that actually have the yeah. so, mm, No, ours is a lot heavier. So yes. it's a scale length scale. Also, this is very, like I said, very preliminary and very low for us that you're seeing. Yeah. So we are actually have more recent data that has much higher values because basically uh one of the things that you see, you don't see it here, but the design of the shaft really matters. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, where you add flexibility and where you don't. Mm -hmm. So right now, what you have this part is called the peduncle, mm -hmm. and right now we allow it's too flexible. Mm -hmm. so we found that uh, uh, to there are peduncles that has more, but you have to basically do amplitude limits the amplitude of flapping to be able to get it to be 
Buddhist and Northwest. So when they did text, and they spread out their spectral thin. Yes. Meaning that they were going to have to look for velocity and have a little compensation. Yes. So, yeah, so part of the studies with incoming flow velocities, right? There's actually two big things. A, you do have the, you know, the forward velocity that causes the take off. B, they're actually operating in ground effect. Right. So they're so close to the water surface that there is a benefit of being very close. So that would also help them. Of course, ground effect is a little bit meaningless to accept without forward velocity. So those, those are really important set of experiments. Yes. And this is what I'm talking about. This is a video. You won't be. This is a fly fish. That's how fast it is. This is real time. I would like to tell you that's our robot. It's not. It's actually. It's a robot. Oh, it's a robot. Big, exactly. It's it's a robot. Uh, but yeah, so we are able to, you know, this, this interesting robotic model organism to test all these hypotheses in a very modular robotic system. And again, some hypotheses might not be, you know, come, part of the testing is you can get the non hypothesis too. All right. So now let's go from actuation and locomotion strategies and move to control strategies. Now, again, like I mean, what I mean by control strategies are passive and active uh, flow, passive flow control strategies and active flight. So I want to look at just one, we studied um, several feather systems in my lab. I want to talk to you about one. This work is, sorry, I should say that. This work is led by uh, these three students, Gary Gassetti, who's a postdoc, who's going to be in the market soon. If you're interested in unsteady aerodynamics, he's at um i have no i have no shame and then this is uh ahmed uh osman he's doing some of the passive flow control and this is dia zikri he's doing some of the active flight control all right <clears throat> so uh what are coverts here this is a macau and you'll see it flying in a little bit of dust and it's going to try to land and there's a group of feathers on the top surface of the wing and those are called the coverts what we know about the coverts is uh, they are contour feathers, meaning they give the shape of the wing on the top and bottom surface. And um, there are multiple rows. So there's front, medium, and back, or lesser, medium, and greater feathers. And here's a, this heron is like shows you some snapshots here of it's actually like of these coverts deploying in flight. We know from one of the uh, few studies on actually the coverts on birds that their deployment is observed more when there's a gust. All right, or when it's trying to land uh, at a, doing a high, high angle of attack landing or perching maneuver. Now, when you study things like that, the first thing you have to kind of synthesize, take a bite size of is how do you create an engineering analogy? So, um, before, actually, how do you create an engineering analogy? But let me show you this. So the question we're asking for this section is, can we implement the covert inspired flaps or system for passive flow control? And by, by, what, by passive flow control, I mean, something that would reduce separation, uh, allow the wing to operate at higher angles of attack, be more maneuverable, to be more aggressive in the kind of you know, things that it can do, the flight missions it can carry out, or active, for example, to stabilize yaw or roll for a uh, flying wing, um, uh, you know, for a flying wing, for example, something that doesn't have a vertical stabilizer or an elevator. So let's start with passive flow control. Now, like I said, the system is really complicated, right? There's multiple rows, it is really flexible. The wing is 3D. It has many functions besides just being a flow control. We actually don't know if it's a flow control device. Um, so what? how do you start? You start by doing, I'm going to actually go, an engineering analogy. And in the engineering analogy, we take this really complicated system and we just do this. What is ours one? And we'll get on it just oscillate, in, you know, in, in, in response to aerodynamic flow. And then we'll try to see what happens if you put several of them. And then we'll say, what can, what, well, how about if we start tuning the parameters of the single system so that it can passively adapt to different things? And then try to think about, you know, span wise and cord wise distribution. So, to do this, what we do is we put this wing in the wind tunnel. We're able to do um, a PIV. So, we're able to look at a plane. This is maybe this how the system, uh, how we like, um, built the system. There's just an airfoil with multiple of these flaps and we can control how many of them. We can see which ones to deploy, which ones not. And when we do that, this is, for example, a video of uh, just two of these uh, flaps moving in response there. There's no sensing, there's no actuation. Basically, the angle of attack that we're operating at 
causes turbulence or causes separation, these kind of things just oscillate. This system gives us um, this, one, this experimental um, setup allows us to, to, you know, to measure lift and drag and moment with a, a force transducer. And the PIV allows us to look at the flow field, the velocity field around the wing. This is a pretty bad velocity field because air is separated at the leading edge. And all you see here is uh, basically turbulence. So if you look at the lift here, this would be a significant lift drop. All right, so let's look at the single flap system. So this is a typical lift curve. This is a typical lift curve um, of just the airfoil. And again, the angle of attack I showed you earlier was 20. So this is where there is a significant lift drop. <clears throat> now you add a single flap at the leading edge. You see, there's no pe penalty, but then it opens prematurely because I didn't control the thickness of this thing, so it just deploys prematurely. But then look at post all you get lift improvements. Depending on which flap you open, right? Whether you open a, a front flap or an intermediate flap or somewhere in the middle, so I'm opening all of them, you get very different. Like you get a penalty pre stall, you get, but for all of them post stall, there's a benefit. And if you look at drag, most of these configurations reduces drag. So now you improve lift, you reduce drag. This means <coughs> you improve efficiency post-all. So you can carry payload at this high angle of attack. You can support your weight at this high angle of attack, right? So if you actually not, but okay, this is interesting. However, you, you know, if you want to use it for low control, you want to understand the mechanism so you know how to exploit them. So here we're going to look at the angle of attack of 20. If you look at the red curve and the blue curve at angle of attack of 20, they have very similar lift improvements. However, if you look at the flow field, they're actually very different. So let's look at this. This is a flow field of just the baseline and here it's separated shear layer. Now you go ahead and you add a leading edge flap and this orange line is actually a lot closer to the surface. So you bring the shear layer down closer. This you know, allows you to delay separation, it provides a uh, less severe curvature essentially for the air to go around and you're able to enhance lift in that way. Now, if you look at the trailing edge flap, this orange line is the same, right? It doesn't have the same mechanism, it's too far gone to be doing this. But what it's happening is the oscillation, look at the oscillations of this flap compared to this flap. This flap is almost not oscillating at all. Look at this one, it's really oscillating. And what it's doing is interacting with the trailing edge vortex and creating a pressure there. It's preventing the propagation of this adverse pressure gradient forward and increasing the pressure ahead of the flap. Both of these are lift enhancing mechanisms. Now it's important to understand that because depending on, <clears throat> uh, for the one, for the angle of attack that I picked, they're similar. But for other angles of attack, for lower angles of attack, you wanna engage this one first. For higher angles of attack, you wanna engage this first. All right. <laughs> now, if you take this analogy and make it a little bit more dangerous and add more flaps and interact with them, have them interact with one another, you get something really interesting. So this is the baseline. This is the single flap from before, nothing changed. Let's add another one. Look at angle of attack 20, more lift. <laughs> add another one, more lift. Add another one, add another one. All right, so now you, we're looking at like about 55% lift enhancement. Actually, if you're able, if you're able to design something that can track the baseline until here, you don't, you never stall, right? You never have a significant sharp drop in this, okay? And if the flow field tells the story. And actually, if you can, uh, what this means is we can tune this passive response. If we have something, let's say a simple, and we are doing this now, a small electromagnet, that depending on the angle of attack, lets the flap deploy or not. We're not really controlling that. We're not prescribing the section or anything, right? It's basically a magnet on and off. Each flap can be on or off. You can tune your lift enhancements, right? If you want maximum lift enhancement, go for it. If you're operating in a gust, for example, which is generally which is increasing your lift anyway, maybe you don't want to deploy all the time, okay? <clears throat> you can also control the order of the deployment, which matter, I'm not talking about that today, but it matters whether you go front to back or back to front. So this could be interesting. And the flow field says the story beautifully, to be honest. This is the baseline. Again, you add one flap. This is what I showed you earlier, right? It brings this shear layer over. 
but behind it is pretty separated. Now let's look at all of them together. The shear layer brings and it's kind of almost like handing it from one to the other, right? The the tip of the flap is interacting with the shear layer at every station, and then the trailing edge flap is going back. Go ahead. Uh, and what about the stiffness for the precise to one each flap? Yeah. Stay tuned. <laughs> uh, so stay tuned. Two two more slides. Uh, so this is interesting, right? If you look at lift gain and drag reduction for one flap, you have some lift benefit and some drag benefits. You make it two flap, it becomes two flap, becomes more yellow, more benefits. You add three flaps, great. Four, five. You said, Amy, just why don't you do 20 flaps? Come on, let's do it. No, actually, if you look at the yellowness of the thing, it's like there's a point of diminishing return, right? There is, the more flaps you add, you start not really getting any more benefits. And you even saw that with the lift increases, right? So there is a point of diminishing return. And to Sal's point, there's always a significant pre stall penalty that you pay. So can we tailor the flap parameters themselves to reduce this lift penalty and exploit the post stall penalty? And to do that, we move to the next part of the analogy. Where we start thinking about the flat fiber, aka the hinge stiffness and its inertia, right? <clears throat> and for the sake of time, this is actually more biologically relevant because if you look at coverts, uh, all feathers, there's a rachis and that has some stiffness and it has some mass, it has some inertia. So this is now the system that we've designed, right? Where we have some stiffness, we have some inertia. <clears throat> and uh, if you do this, the stiffness controls your mean angle of attack. Sorry, you mean angle of deflection, right? So here, this is the low stiffness case that I showed you. Look at the angle of the flap. Uh, this is a higher stiffness, so you can control the mean beta. And we found that this really controls the lift improvements you get, okay? <clears throat> so that's the first knob. Think of it as a control knob. If you're able to, you know, I've saw some variable stiffness first, saw some deep, deep meaning when we were talking earlier, right? So if you can think of, a, or contact aided mechanisms that depending on how, could be still passive. As you increase the angle, you can become more in contact. So you can reduce your stiffness. You can also distribute that stiffness in the cordwise direction, right? If you want the leading edge flap to be open less than a trailing edge flap, so these are some of the control knobs. We also found those videos are running. The difference between this video and this video is the inertia of the flap. This is made out of mylar, which is a very thin. This is made out of plastic. So by um, changing the inertia, you are changing the fluid structure interaction mechanism. One is really dynamic and one is static. So as we found earlier, you probably want the leading edge flap to be less dynamic and want the trailing edge to be very dynamic. So that's a knob for the dynamics and the fluid structure interaction mechanism that you're exploiting. <clears throat> and the last thing I'm not showing here, the location. So we tested this at different locations, even a single flap, and we found uh, in the leading edge, a flap is either, think about it as a switch, either improve lift or doesn't, no matter what you do for the stiffness, it doesn't really matter that much. For the trailing edge, you want higher stiffness, and it's very the lift benefits you get are very are highly a function of stiffness. So you can also it's an for sensitivity, right? So think of these are your gains, uh, but they're structural gains, they're like stiffness and location and inertia, right? So in summary, uh, as far as the passive flow control part piece. I showed you that there's different mechanisms you can tap into them with different parameters and you can combine them to really enhance one effect to reduce the other. And I, I should say, to answer your question, when we added the stiffness, we really uh, uh, mitigated a lot of the pre stall penalties that you saw because the flaps didn't open when the flows were needed, right? Um, now let's go to active. So here, this is a flying wing. This actual project is supported by Trina, Toyota Research Institute in North America. They have something called the Mothership Project. It's an inflatable kite that's supposed to harvest energy in Japan's canopy uh, and use the wind resources for you know, energy generation. Um, so it's inflatable. There's no vertical stabilizer. There's a horizontal stabilizer. And they really need to be able to control yaw because the best maneuver to control to, for energy harvesting is a figure eight. To do this, you really need to control uh, yaw. So uh, here it is in, at their wind wall in Michigan. Uh, and there's two flaps, one on the top, one on the bottom. So let me tell you a little bit about that. So this is the mother, uh, this is a kite. It's called the Mother Shapron. This is a kite, uh, an inflatable structure. 
And the whole working principle is we can, birds don't do this. If during the, during the video I showed you, the coverts and both wings were deploying. But this is maybe beyond biology, and this is okay. You can learn the biological principle and then exploit them beyond the observable behavior in nature, right? For engineering gains. So if you do this asymmetrically, you can create a lift and drag you know, difference, and you can control, create moments, yawing, rolling moments. So we did this. In this case, now the flap uh, deflection is prescribed. We prescribe it to a, a given angle, and we measure lift and drag, and we do PIV. Uh, and then some of the parameters we care about is the location where. So the question is, if I want to maximize your control, where would I put the flap on the suction side? How much do I deflect it? Where do I put it on the pressure side? And how much do I deflect? Those is basically the question. And is there a benefit of having both flaps? So we do some, we look at main effect plots. We have, we have data-driven models of these systems. And basically, you know, uh, so we can have time to interact with one another. We find that it is beneficial to have top and surface flaps uh, because this maximizes your control range or your control authority. Uh, depending if you're in pre-stall, these are the most important parameters uh, for lift. This is the most important parameters for drag. And you get a larger modulation range if you have simultaneous deflection. So if you go top and bottom together. And compared to, I'm not comparing our forms to V2, but most <laughs> flying wings uh, would have co-located trailing edge flaps, right? So for our system, we put co-located trailing edge flaps. And then our best configuration from maximize yaw and keep roll the same was this configuration that you want and actually don't want them co-located. You want the top effector to be in the leading edge and the bottom effector to be at the trailing edge. Mm -hmm. So for similar uh, yaw uh, moments, right? Assuming that's proportional to lift, we can increase drag by 840% compared to them 560. Now, this you don't want to do this for efficiency, right? You want to do this for control authority. So you have more control authority. Now, I am sure uh, the B2 designers had other considerations. But <laughs> as far as, you know, if you take everything away and you say, I want to maximize y'all, you would want to <clears throat> do not, you, you wouldn't want to co-locate your flaps. And we tested this in ground, like I showed you. So here you'll see there's a trailing edge uh, pressure side flap and a, um, a leading edge suction side flap. We actually tested this in flight. So the only control surfaces on this vehicle are the poles. There is no, there are no other, the only, there's like a bridle that controls the pitch, but for roll and yaw, this is the only control effectors. And you'll see them opening. They are located in this video, co-located in this video, not because it's the best location, but because fabrication constraints and how the fabric is the only place where you can stitch into the fabric is the leading edge. But we're working with Trina to think about other fabrication techniques to put them in the right place. And here it is in flight, doing the figure eight maneuver that I told you was necessary for energy harvesting. Again, using nothing but the covert flaps. <clears throat> So what you'll see, like you'll see a sudden drop, that's not, that's by design. So we basically want to harvest energy, go back, repeat the maneuver, go back as fast as possible. Uh, so in summary, last two slides, uh, you, this, like, it's really iterative, right? What you start saying, I want to design better flow control devices. Now we actually have a hypothesis that we're collaborating with ornithologists to say, is this what birds are seeing? And they're like, oh yeah, but your design doesn't really capture what's really important. You really need to be pitching up while we're doing this. So now we're updating the experiments to look, can we do it while we're pitching up and see, does it even matter, right? Are the birds even exploiting them for flow control or they're just a mechanism of giving the wing a shape and they're flexible so they deflect. Um, <clears throat> now this work is not, would not be possible with collaborators. So the Click Beetle is a collaboration with Mariana Lean, she's an entomologist, Jake Soha, Virginia Tech. Brooke Fleming is uh, the, my collaborator on the fish. Uh, flying fish project and Andreas Goza is a computational fluid dynamicist uh, that's helping out with like this my my collaborator in the covert. So um, with that, I'd like to thank you and take any questions. And, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'll stop the recording here, but before it's open for questions, so. Uh,